Thank you for allowing us to be able to worship in a country where we are currently not persecuted for our beliefs. Thank you for giving us the word rightly divided so that we can clearly understand what you'd have in store for us during this dispensation of grace so that we can learn more and instruct and edify others too. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as expected, this is Father's Day, so we have a Father's Day lesson. And the title is A Father in the Dispensation of Grace. As is frequently the case, many of the verses and topics that I will be discussing today are not new to you. They should be familiar, but we're just going to take a look at them another time and package them up in a way that my hope is that will edify you and be able to edify others. We will be bouncing around quite a bit in the Bible, but that's why I put the outline together that you have in front of you. That will allow you to get back on track in case I lose you, and it will allow you the opportunity to take these verses with you and study them at home if you would like. So I will follow along the outline very closely and very similar to what you have. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. A Father in a Dispensation of Grace. It's really never been easy to be a father, and I know that's a cliche, but it really has never been easy to be a father. And during this time, it is no different. And for us as fathers, the biggest obstacle is ourselves and our flesh. Now, lest you think that I will be unfair and not talk about mothers, that is true. This is a Father's Day message and not a Mother's Day message. So the mothers get off of the hook today. So we're not going to do that. This is directed to fathers, so including me. So all the mothers can rest assured you're not going to be on target. So for us dads that are here, we are our usual own worst enemies about being a good dad. A father could learn several godly characteristics through Paul's teaching. So today I would like to take a look at some of those traits. So that's why I have the outline before you. But before we take a look at the traits of being a godly father, let's look at some of our weaknesses as dads. So if you can, turn with me to Genesis. Let's go back to the beginning. And let's find out a little bit about some of our character traits and from where they originated. Genesis chapter 3. And on your outlines, it's Roman numeral 1. And this is known as a father's or a man's inherent weaknesses. And the first point I'd like to mention, one of our weaknesses is denying or hiding from responsibility. Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 12, I will read. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave it unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And when they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto the Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee, that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. So we see that Adam attempted to hide from responsibility. Now, contrary to us, Adam cannot use the excuse that his parents taught him poorly, or he was reared in a bad neighborhood, or his teachers failed him. No one had to teach Adam to deny responsibility. This came inherently with sin. He had a perfect father, and he lived in a perfect environment, and he ate well every day, and he never was sick. And when Adam said, I was afraid and hid myself, and then thrust blame onto Eve, 
that problem came as a result of sin. So we men have to realize we don't have to be taught to hide from responsibility. That comes inherent with our nature. And that's one of our weaknesses as men, as fathers, is that we have an inherent weakness recorded as the very first act after sin in the Bible. What's our second inherent weakness as men or fathers? Listening to others instead of God. We're still in Genesis. Stay there with me. We're going to go down a couple verses in chapter 3. Turn with me, starting in verse 17. Starting in verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall bring it forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Back up in verse 17. The Lord God said, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. So one of our second inherent weaknesses is we tend to listen to other people instead of God. Obviously, how can we avoid that? The more we know the word of God, the more we know that the advice from other people may not be good. But Adam, again, without any excuses of his upbringing, listened to other people before he listened to God. And what's the last thing we see, one of our inherent weaknesses? Adam was not deceived. Again, we as men like to use the excuse sometimes that it was not our fault, not our responsibility. I was duped or I didn't know better. In this case, Adam was not deceived, and that's very clearly described in 1 Timothy 2.14. You don't have to turn there because I'm just going to quote part of it. But the verse actually says, it opens up by saying, Adam was not deceived. Adam knew full well what he was doing. He knew. Now, Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. Romans 5.14, Paul writes again, in Romans 5.14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. It was Adam's transgression. Adam was the one that sinned. So before we get on to our responsibility as men or fathers, let's first understand that we have weaknesses that are built in there that you cannot shift to your parents or to your teachers or to your economic social environment or any other responsibility you'd like to pass on. We like to hide from responsibility, and that's common. Again, if you look at many of the divorce proceedings that occur today, usually children are given to the mother, usually, because the father usually doesn't want them or doesn't want the responsibility. We listen to other people more frequently than we do to God. And we also understand that we are not deceived, that we have the responsibility to understand God's word. So if you move on to Roman numeral two, what is a man's or a father's expected behavior in the home? Again, this is Father's Day. So let's take a look at some of our expected behavior and responsibility in the home. Let's first take a look as a father. And this is a verse that I've heard a few times. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Similarly, in Colossians 3.21, we find, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. All right, well, let's stop and take a look at these verses, because if this is our expected behavior as fathers in our home, let's find out what these verses really mean, because someone can take these verses and twist them to manipulate men or fathers to do something else. So, first of all, we find in both Ephesians and Colossians, it says, don't provoke your children to anger. 
So what does that phrase mean? Well, what I did is, was commonly in the case, and what we're encouraged to do is let's do word searches and phrase searches in the Bible. And I just so happened to find the phrase, provoke to anger. I found that seven times. But they're all in the Old Testament. And that's fine, because we can use the Old Testament to define terms. We're not looking at defining doctrinal basis, because we live in the dispensation of grace, but we can use the Old Testament to define terms. So I will not go through all seven of these occurrences, but I'm going to pick out three or four of them to let's find out what provoke not or provoked anger really means. Deuteronomy 4.25 in your outline. It says, When thou shalt beget children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So we see provoked anger in this verse, but it's preceded by doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Staying in Deuteronomy, let's go up a couple more verses. Deuteronomy 31, verse 29. It says, For I know that after my death ye shall utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. We see that again. We see about provoking him to anger being associated with doing evil. All right, now in your Old Testament, jump up to 2 Kings chapter 17. Let's look at another reference. You're probably starting to see a consistent theme here, and when we finish these references, we will circle back to the Pauline teaching in Ephesians and Colossians and try to bring it together. 2 Kings 17, verse 17. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil on the side of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Yet again, we see provoked anger being associated with evil. And then finally, let's look at 2 Chronicles 33.6. If you'd like on your own time, you could look at these other verses, Deuteronomy 9.18, 1 Kings 16.33, 2 Kings 21.6. I, I didn't want to take the time to read all of these to you, but turn to 2 Chronicles 33.6. We'll look at the last example. And this is very similar to 2 Kings 17. But in 2 Chronicles 33, 6, we find the following. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. Sounds like a really good character here. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So back in Ephesians and Colossians, when we read about fathers provoke not your children to wrath or provoke not your children to anger, it's associated with doing something evil biblically. That doesn't necessarily mean don't tease your children. It just says don't provoke them to wrath. So as a father, you are not to do evil on the side of the Lord Abuse your children, uh, neglect your children. You're not to do something evil such that you're going to provoke your children to wrath. They may be bitter against you. They may choose to be angry. So as a father or as a husband and as a man, you are not to provoke your children to wrath. Now in these verses in Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3, we find a second thing here. It says we are to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So if that's our responsibility, let's take a look to see how that is defined in the Bible, because we clearly know it's something that we, that I, have to do. Now, my children are at the age where they're mostly reared and pretty much on their own. And I think there may be some out here or within earshot 
where that may not be the case. So we are to nurture and admonish in the Lord. Webster's 1828 dictionary provides the following definition of nurture. That which promotes growth, education, and instruction. Now the interesting thing when I looked that up in Webster's definition, he actually referred back to Ephesians 4 when defining that word. So that, that's really kind of cool when you look at that. How many dictionaries today will use the Bible to define the words? So if we are to nurture and admonish, the nurturing means to promote growth, education, and instruction. So the Holy Spirit provides two, maybe more, but I found at least two good cross-references in Paul's teaching for admonish. So if that's our responsibility as a man or a father, and we're sticking here in a dispensation of grace, I wanted to stick with the Holy Spirit's teaching as provided through Paul in his writing. So Romans chapter 15, if you'd like to turn there with me, we'll look at the characteristics of what we as dads, as fathers, have to do if we are to nurture and admonish. So Romans chapter 15, verse 14. Paul writes to the church at Rome, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. So if we are to admonish one another, there are preconditions to do that biblically. Number one, we as dads or fathers, we need to be full of goodness, and we need to be filled with all knowledge. So that is an encouragement for us to be familiar with the Word of God, especially as presented to us, rightly divided in the dispensation of grace through Paul's teaching. If we are to fulfill our role of admonishing our children and nurturing them, we have to do that from a foundation of knowledge. Otherwise, it's just lecturing children on opinions. We are to be filled with goodness and knowledge. 1 Thessalonians, let's take a look at this. 1 Thessalonians 5.12, it gives another condition of nurturing and admonishing that we as dads need to have if we are to do our job, not only today on Father's Day, but the other 364 days of the year. 1 Thessalonians 5.12, Paul writes, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you and the Lord and admonish you. So there's a second characteristic we see if we are to carry out our responsibility of admonishing, we need to establish authority in the home. Paul writes here, and again, 1 Thessalonians 5.12, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you and the Lord and admonish you. So in this case, to effectively admonish in the home, you have to have some position of authority. Again, this is not to be a dictator in the home, but it's clearly evident that a father needs to have a position of authority. So that means, number one, you cannot capitulate that authority, neither can you delegate that authority, neither can you abdicate that authority. That authority must be established in the home. You must establish that authority. So we've looked at a man or a father's expected behavior in the, in the home. Again, we talked about provoking not your children to anger, don't do evil, and nurture and admonish. You're supposed to bring your children up, rear them up, so you have to have some knowledge and you have to have some authority. All right, let's move on to the next Roman numeral. And the next Roman numeral I should say the next letter is as a husband. So we've talked about being a good father. Let's take a small corollary to that and being a good husband. That comes with the territory of being a father. Ephesians 5, 25 through 31. And you've, you've all read these verses before, so you're not going to be surprised by anything new here, but we're going to look at this in light of Father's Day. This is how we need to be a good husband in the home. Ephesians 5, 25 through 31. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, 
that he might present itself to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now this is chock full of criteria to be a good husband. I'm just going to pick a few of these out. We're supposed to love as Christ loved the church. We are to love our wife as Christ loved the church. And ultimately, what did Christ do? He gave his life for the church. So if you want to be a good father, if you want to be a good husband to your wife, you must be prepared to do that. Number two is to help make his wife more godly. Again, verses 25 on it says, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Verse 27, he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. A good husband needs to help make his wife more godly. And Colossians 3.19, husbands love your wives and be not bitter against them. We, as good fathers and as good husbands, should not be bitter towards our wives. Now, this is still kind of a mystery to me because it seems somewhat unusual. Why would that instruction be in place? And my goal here is not to make a judgment call, but apparently, in a marriage relationship, the Holy Spirit has noted that there are conditions or there are times where the wife will react to the husband in such a way that the husband will react bitterly. Again, I'm not going to make a judgment call and list when and why and how that occurs. And I'm certainly not going to bring any personal references in here, even if I were right. But all I know is that the Bible is 100% clear that as a loving husband, as a father, we are not to be bitter towards our wives. Again, I, I don't necessarily know that entirely. I, I can't speak as clearly as I'd like to about that, but there is something in a marriage relationship that will cause that to happen. It doesn't really happen that much in my marriage, but it, it apparently does because otherwise the Holy Spirit would not have instructed Paul to write it. So men, just be careful and don't be bitter towards your wife. So now let's move on to Roman numeral three. What is a man or father's expected behavior in the church? Okay, we've talked about our inherent weaknesses. We've talked about our behavior in the home. Now, if we want to be good dads, if we want to be good fathers, let's see how this portrays in the assembly, in the church setting. And I think there are really three words that can sum this up, and that's what we'll finish up the day with. Exhort, comfort, and charge. Now, where do I get that? Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12. And we will try to build this case for a, a good father or a good husband or a good man in the local assembly. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12. Paul again is writing to the church at Thessalonica, and he says... But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Verse 11, here we go. As ye know how we exhorted, one, and comforted, two, and charged, three. 
Every one of you, as a father, doth his children. That's how this links together. Okay, why did I bring this verse up? This is how we, as fathers or men, need to behave and function in a church. Paul says it clearly here, verse 11. Let me go over it again. As ye know how we exhorted, comforted, and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. So we need to do that in our household as a father, but we also need to do it in a church setting. Verse 12, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. So let's break apart each of these things that we're supposed to do that Paul has outlined in the dispensation of grace for us as dads. Okay, number one is exhort. We are commanded or instructed to do that. Exhort is to teach or to instruct as to follow godly teaching. 1 Thessalonians 4.1 Furthermore, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you. Those go together. Beseech and exhort by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and how to please God, so ye would abound more and more. So what Paul's saying here is, look, you've received of us how you should walk and please God, so we are exhorting you to take what we've taught you and teach others also. So we need to do that in the church and in our home. Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. So once again, if we, are to our if we are to exhort within a church setting, we have to do it by sound doctrine. So this position of being a father does come with it some responsibility from a biblical and spiritual side. We have to know from where we're coming. You can't just have authority and you can't just spout out details and want people to obey you or follow you unless you come from a position of authority. It needs to happen. Paul exhibited this behavior to the church at Rome when he expressed his wish in Romans 1, 11, and 12, if you'd like to turn there with me. Romans 1, 11, and 12. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. When Paul needed to address the Corinthians' carnal behavior, he spoke to them as he would have expected a father to speak to his children. Again, I'll say this again. When Paul needed to address the Corinthians' carnal behavior, he spoke to them as he would have expected a father to speak to his children. We find this in 1 Corinthians. So I will slow down a little bit, let you turn there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 14 through 16 and then verse 21. So as a dad, as Chad mentioned earlier, anger is an issue that you're going to have to address appropriately. And your children will at times make you angry, but you have to be very careful on how you respond to them. And Paul did an example, or provided an example for us on how he responded to the Corinthians. Now, I wish I could always stand up here and say that I've done all these things right, but again, as a teacher of God's Word, my goal is not to come up here and tell you everything that I've done or my experience. It is to share with you the Word of God. So that's what I'm here to do because this lesson is for me as much as anyone else. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. So there's the context that we're talking about. Paul is writing to this church as though they were his beloved sons. And so what is he doing? He's not writing to shame them. His goal as a dad or as a father figure is not to ridicule or to put down or be destructive, not to shame the church, but is to exhort them and lift them up. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. 
For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod? Or in love and in the spirit of meekness? That is the example that Paul provided for us. And he used the fatherly or the familial examples here. And so what's the second thing? We've talked about exhort. That's how we are to behave in the church. And the next thing is comfort. Best comfort is that which we have received of the Lord. So if we are to comfort people in the church, if we are to comfort our children, comfort our wives, the best way we're going to do that is once again from a biblical or spiritual background. So let's see if we can prove that here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Again, I'll try to slow down so you can keep up if you'd like. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. But that's part of the reason why I've given you the outlines here. So if I lose you, you can find your trail again. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us and all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So if we are to comfort people, it's not just giving them a hug and giving them a smooch and saying, be of good comfort. In this case, Paul's pretty clear that we get our comfort through our tribulation, but from the Lord. And as a result of those tribulations and what we have learned, we then can be a better comfort to others around us, especially in the church or in our family. So remember, when you're providing comfort, my hope is that you will provide comfort based upon a foundation of biblical teaching and experience that you've had. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Again, we're talking about comforting within a church as a responsibility of a man or a father. And we we're going to see how this comfort originated and what's the foundation for this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, which ye sorrow not, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Again, this is talking about the catching up or those that have died. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are asleep and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Verse 16, But the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We're talking about the catching up here. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort, there's that word, comfort one another with these words. We see again the example of comforting associated with a biblical or spiritual foundation. That's what we need to remember. A good teacher, a good father, shall direct his pupils to the comfort of the scriptures. Simultaneously, the good teacher or father should not look to please his own flesh. Paul outlines this in Romans 15, 1 through 4. Romans 15, 1 through 4. Again, we're speaking from a Father's Day point of view here, which is applicable here. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Again, I'll say this. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. It doesn't say we are strong are to tout our abilities. We that are strong need to mock those that are weak. If you're strong, with that comes responsibility. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. You know, being strong comes with responsibility. Same way with being knowledgeable. You do have a responsibility that comes with that. Verse 2, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself... But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproacheth thee fell on me. 
For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. Again, we see comfort again. We need to comfort others, especially when we are strong. Okay, let's look at the last responsibility we have in the local church as fathers or men, and that is to charge. With the inflection, charge. <laughs> charge, that denotes a stronger action than exhort. Sometimes you read the words in the Bible and it just seems like it's repetition, but when these words are distinctly written, they do mean different things. So charge denotes a stronger action than exhort. It is a command with authority. It's not just a command, it's a command with authority. Okay, so let's set the foundation for that. 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to be in 1 and 2 Timothy for this last section, so you won't have to move around much. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. Paul says to Timothy, and now remember, Timothy is the young preacher that Paul has taken under his wing and is encouraging him. So that's kind of the background of... First and Second Timothy, Paul says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. First Timothy chapter six, move up a chapter, looking at verse 13. Paul says, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. We see the word charge here a little differently than we see exhort. Exhort's more on a personal level, more on a, uh, let's have a dialogue. Charge is, really not, does not imply a dialogue here. It's that you've done your teaching, you've done in your instructions, and now it's a reminding and say, okay, look, I'm in a position of authority. I've grounded you with a base. And now I am reminding you with authority what you need to do. It's taking your children, taking your congregation to the next level. When giving a charge, one may also need to convey the need for courage. Because trouble may be ahead for the individual to whom you are giving the charge. So yes, you charge them, but you don't say, yep, I'm behind you all the way and start backing up. You need to remind them that they may encounter some issues too. Where do we find that? Well, Paul was jailed for preaching the mystery of the gospel. So instead of telling Timothy to compromise the truth and avoid personal affliction and, in, and earn personal gain, Paul charges him to partake of the afflictions of teaching the truth. So when you charge someone, you're going to have to let them know that maybe they're going to encounter some difficulty. What does 2 Timothy 1.8 says? What does it say? Paul writes to Timothy, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me of his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So nothing more important than the charge to teach the gospel. Nothing more important. Paul knew this was true and did not fail to charge Timothy to do that. So let's finish this section up in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to look at 1 Timothy. So 2 Timothy 4.1. Paul knew that charging someone, in this case, it's almost like, okay, I, I'm out of the picture, I'm moving out of the picture, I've bestowed upon you all my teaching, it's, it's time that you take the torch. 2 Timothy 4.1. I charge thee before God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove. Rebuke. There's exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. So Paul has charged Timothy with many tasks here, but one of those is exhort. And by the way, preach the word, be in, instant, in season, out of season. It doesn't say ben, be instant, in season, and out of season. It says be instant, in season, comma, out of season. That means make your out of seasons in season. So if you're caught off guard, you need to be prepared instantly to be in season. 
So in other words, you need to always be in season, even when it is out of season for you. And especially as a dad, you know that things are going to come up all the time and you're not going to be ready for it. And you're not going to, it's not going to fit in your calendar. It's not going to fit on your agenda for the day. And I can speak from experience that I've certainly failed there. It's not going to be on your agenda. It's going to be your out of season, but you need to make it in season. First Timothy 1, 18 and 19, this charge I commit unto the son, Timothy, again, that fatherly son relationship here. First Timothy 1, 18 and 19, this charge I commit unto the son, Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. So as Paul is charging Timothy, he doesn't say it's going to be a bed of roses. It's going to be a, it's going to be a warfare. So we need, when we charge people, to sometimes tell them what they may face. So we've looked at, to, let's wrap things up here. We've looked at our inherent weaknesses. We've looked at a man or a father's responsibility in the home. We've looked at a man or a father's responsibility in the local church. Now, what happens when there's a fatherless existence? What happens if this is not going on? Well, I'm not going to take a lot of time for that, but I just want to look at a couple examples. Again, I'm going to go back to the Old Testament. It is interesting to note that fatherless appears 43 times in the Bible. The concept of fatherless appears 43 times in the Bible, but no times in Paul's writing during the dispensation of grace. That's interesting. Again, you may be able to draw a conclusion in that. Paul has done such a good job of teaching us to be good fathers. That's maybe why he didn't talk about being fatherless, but it appears 43 times. I found it 43. Maybe you can find it more. But it's all in the Old Testament. I should say outside of the dispensation of grace. So when the term fatherless is found, it is usually associated with a negative environment. So dads, if you're out there, if you choose to abdicate your role... If you choose to delegate that role, it's usually not going to end well. Zechariah chapter 7. Let's look at the example of a fatherless environment. Zechariah chapter 7 verse 10. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Apparently, the widow and the fatherless were oppressed at times. So there was a charge to the Old Testament folks not to oppress the widow or the fatherless. Malachi chapter 3 verse 5. Malachi chapter 3 verse 5. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. So if you as a dad today on Father's Day choose not to play the role that you have, usually it's not a good sign. So to conclude, what I'd like to say is let's take a look if I could find one verse that I would like to use to exhort and to charge the dads out there, if I could find one verse that is reasonably closely related and reasonably within context, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 11. And this is in Paul's writing during the dispensation of grace. So I would like to leave you dads, and like I said, moms, you're off the hook today. This is not Mother's Day. We could have probably had the same type of lesson on Mother's Day, but we'll maybe save that for next year. So dads, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So that's my exhortation my charge to the men out there on Father's Day. Yep, when you were a kid, you talked like a kid, you understood like a kid, you thought like a kid, and you acted like a kid. That's fine as a child. But now you're a man. 
It's time to put those things away. Take the responsibility that you have. It's time to grow up. So that's my exhortation and charge for you men today. Father, again, thank you for your word. Father, first of all, thank you for the salvation you've given us. And as a dad, thank you for the family that you've given me. Thank you for the wife that you've given me. Thank you for the children that you've given me. And thank you, Father, for putting the men and women in my life when I was young that directed me to the Bible so that I did not wreak havoc in my family with an unspiritual and unscriptural environment. Oh, Lord, I, like the the men out here, are not perfect, and Lord knows I'm not perfect, and I admit it. But, Father, we have the Word of God in our life. We had the Word of God in our family so that when mistakes were made, we had an anchor to go back to, to straighten things out. So my encouragement to the men that are here today that are listening, that they take the responsibility that they have on Father's Day, be thankful for the privileges that they've been given, but take it and move with the responsibility they have to not only love their wives, but to rear their children and function in a local church so that others are edified and they are themselves not pleased. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.